Exactly. Yeah. And really, those are the two main steps in building. Like, once you've got your ore or any rock that's valuable from out of the tunnels that goes into the top of this, you need machinery that's going to be line that rock up. And then this chemical process is just When we last left you, we were exploring the back rows of Whistler. In this week's video, we're primarily going to be focusing on the Britannia Mine Museum, where we received a private tour of the ground. In this video, we will also include the entire boom show at the museum. I encourage you to watch the entire thing. It really is fascinating to understand their history. As a reminder, please give this video a like and leave a comment. It really helps our videos get noticed on YouTube. If you're not subscribed, consider subscribing as we make videos every week. Now let's get on to that tour. All right, gang, All we right. are off. It is Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> and we had a kind of a lazier start this morning. It is such a nice night last night. 11.30, very great night last it's night. Such a nice morning with coffee and amazing breakfast. And so now we're off to the Britannia mine museum um, we went by this on the way back and we we're like oh we want to go I think see it's that in the town of squamish squamish yeah, yeah. Um, the underground tour is not happening today they're doing some filming but everything else is open and this seems like the best day for us to get this one in so we're going to go do it we're going to show you everything that we see gorgeous out. super excited and it's beautiful out it's like the first mines. day where we didn't have <laughs> any um rain so it yeah. snow last night but no rain which is awesome anyway guys we'll take you with us and we'll see what we see all right so we're coming up to the britannia mine museum here and uh we're gonna be tourists let's take a look How the Britannia Mine Started When most people drive by Britannia Beach today, they have little sense of how massive the Britannia Mine was. At the height of production in the late 1920s to early 1930s, it was supplying an impressive 17% of the world's copper. By the time the mine closed, it had 210 kilometers of tunnels and stretched over 1,750 meters of vertical distance. From 1,100 meters high in the Britannia Mountains to a depth of around 650 meters below sea level. A century and more ago in BC, amateur prospectors were only looking for gold. With the technologies of the day, what they found on the surface of the ground was really all they could rely on. At Britannia, the surface ore was to be found high on the mountains, far, far away from passing foot traffic. So it is probably only by a stroke of luck that the ore was found at all. The discovery of the ore is usually accredited to Dr. A. A. Forbes, a physician to the local First Nations. The story goes that he found surface ore after shooting a buck and it is true that he was the first to recognize the importance of his find, but he was not the first to find ore there. That credit goes to a local fisherman named Granger. In 1888, he met Dr. Forbes at Hopkins Landing on the Sunshine Coast, looking for $400 in return for the samples he had found. In 1931, Dr. Forbes was interviewed by the Vancouver province 
and this is our best record of what happened in 1888. Granger showed me some barren rock on which there was chlorides of copper or nitrate. I told him that was not very encouraging, but there might be some better showing of copper in the vicinity of his find. He was very anxious to buy a boat with his $400 and go to Alaska. I'll show you the place for $400, he proposed. Well, I told him that if I didn't see better mineral than he had shown me, I could not give him anything, but if we found mineral in place, I would give him $400. In a few days, we made the trip, landing on the other side of the ridge north of the present landing. He was no woodsman, and we had a terrible time over that ridge. He took me almost to the summit of the mountain and showed me the spot he had broken the rock from. There were few places not covered with snow, but we slept that night on the summit. Next morning, I began prospecting around the summit, gradually descending towards the valley without success. About an hour and a half before sunset, I saw the famous buck. I shot him in the neck and he kicked around considerably, and when I finally got him killed, I found he had kicked the moss and rubbish off the rock and there was some good showing on the surface. It was getting too dark that night to do anything more, but in the morning I put a shot of dynamite I had with me and found I had got a good showing in place. I then and there paid him the $400 on the condition that he would not speak to anyone in Howe Sound or Vancouver about it. He agreed and in a few days he bought his boat and went to Alaska. So, Dr. Forbes continued, the first discoverer of copper on Britannia was Mr. Granger, the second was Mr. Buck, and the third was Dr. Forbes. When I found the mineral on Britannia Mountain, and for many years afterward, there was little danger in leaving the claim open as no one was looking for any other mineral but gold. As a matter of fact, I was perfectly right in leaving it open, as no one did disturb it for 10 years. I visited the property every summer for eight years, working on it for a week, and never saw a human being on or near that mountain, except when Mr. Granger was with me. In 1893, Dr. Forbes, who had been prospecting interests in two other locations, sought government aid in developing either Britannia or either one or either of the other two properties, Tex Texada Island and Mount Elphinstone. The Ministry of Mines supplied geological reports which found no commercial mineral interests at Britannia. And that was that. Dr. Forbes lost interest in the property and for a few years it seemed as if no development would be made. The Britannia mine operated from 1904 to 1974 and was once the largest copper mine in the British Empire. In its 70 year life, the Britannia mine had a fascinating history. With over 60,000 people living and working here, you can imagine that there are a few stories to tell. There was pioneering work on ore extraction technologies peak production rates making it the then biggest copper mine in the British Empire, dictatorial and benevolent managers, fire, floods, a tragic rock slide, and much more. There's too much story to tell it all here. When the mine was at its peak, the surrounding environment paid a stiff price. Local groundwater, creeks, and the waters of nearby Howe Sound all suffered losses that hung on for many decades. The source of the problem was known as acid rock drainage. Do you know how many panes of glass there are up there? 14,468.
I'm just glad this is the only one I have to keep clean. They let a lot of light into this place, which was great for the electricity bill, but they also let a lot of light out. And as the mill worked through the night, it was a beacon that lit up the waters of Howe Sound, and it could be heard for miles around. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Welcome to Britannia, once one of the largest copper mines in the world, and to mill number three, which in its day was among the most efficient and advanced copper concentrators. This is why this place was built. All 20 stories of it, to liberate the minerals locked inside massive chunks of ore, just like that. One second. Sorry, you have to see this blue girl. Much bigger will rock and order. <laughs> this is ore. It's rock made up mostly of minerals we don't want, but one in particular we do, calcopyrite, because it contains copper. And if they found a few other valuable minerals in there, well, nobody was complaining. But it was copper that the miners were after, because it was here in such abundance. And because copper conducts electricity better than any other metal, except silver. If electricity is the modern world's lifeblood, then copper serves as its veins and arteries. Without it... Yeah, uh, sorry. Well, I guess you get the point. In its day, this mill ranked among the best at coaxing those copper minerals out of the rock. And that efficiency was built right into the design of this building. Each step in the concentration process was located one level below the step before, so that gravity was always helping to move the heavy ore along. And it took a lot of ore to get a little copper. But over the years, the engineers in Britannia got better and better at it. By the time the mill closed, they were extracting 97% of all the copper in the ore. In all, Britannia produced 1.3 billion pounds of refined copper. That's the same weight as 43,000 school buses. That's empty school buses. So, how did they do it? How did they actually get the copper from the rock? I thought you'd never ask. Let me show you. I'm in the uppermost level of the mill. The milling process began with the arrival of train cars loaded with ore from somewhere within the mines, 240 kilometers in tunnels. Then the train cars empty their loads into receiving things below the tracks. The first task was to break up the large chunks of ore in a process known as crushing. Where do they come up with these technical terms? Although it appears empty today, the crushing level was once filled with large machines. The first was called a jaw crusher, which is pretty much how it sounds. It's a set of jaws like a giant nutcracker. It breaks the larger bits of rock down into smaller pieces, about the size of a softball. All the ore was then sent to a second machine called a comb crusher. Like a giant pepper mill, it crunches up the softballs into even smaller pieces, about grape size. And from here, conveyor belts carry the crushed ore to the grinding mills. This is where the rock went into large rotating drums, filled with either steel rods or balls like this one. It's always heavier than I remember. The balls tumbled around inside the drums and smashed the rock into even smaller pieces. From there, we go to secondary grinding. Now mixed with water, the ore was washed into more ball mills. And as you can see, there were a lot of them. On several levels! The ore was then eventually ground down to the consistency of fine sand and water. But now all the different mineral grains in that muddy slurry had to be sorted out. And this is where it gets really interesting. 
they actually found a way to get rock to float. Well, some of it anyway. In flotation, the ground up rock and water mixture was poured into troughs. Certain aromatic oils were added. Here at Britannia, they liked to use pine oil. Then, air was pumped to the bottom of the troughs to create bubbles. As the air bubbles rose through the liquid, the bits of copper mineral clung to them and were drawn to the surface, while the other minerals just sank to the bottom. The copper-rich bubbles remained in a froth at the surface where they could be skipped off. This bubbling mixture often filled the mill with the scent of pine oil. The fourth stage dewatering happened right over there. The froth was piped into large wooden thickening tanks where this time the copper mineral settled to the bottom. This muddy mixture would then be piped into vats where the water was sucked out through canvas filters, leaving a sort of mineral cake behind called copper concentrate. But not the sort of cake you want to put a candle in because this is how it looked. This is what was sent to the smelters to be refined into pure copper metal. So that's the process. That's how mill number three turned rock into copper concentrate. And that's still pretty much how we process minerals today to get the metals that we use in our everyday lives. But you know, this mill was also the pulse of a community. For the townspeople of Britannia Beach, the mechanical thunder coming from this building day and night must have been strangely comforting. Because if they heard those booming sounds, they knew the economy was booming, the mine was producing, and there'd be a paycheck to support their families. Of course, here inside the mill, it was a very different story. It was sometimes so noisy that the workers could barely hear themselves think. I wish there was some way of showing you just how really loud it was in here. Wait, stay with me, I I'm gonna try something here. <laughs> receiving bits and have to be cleared before the next train arrived. And up there, the ship foreman would be told when they needed to deal with it, with a well-placed stick of dynamite. And once in a while, that even blew out the upper row of windows. Fire the hole! Okay, that's got it. And here comes the ore train. Let's start the conveyor belt. And now for the jaw crusher.
Everybody okay? How about we just keep that last part between us? Okay? Okay. So, on November 1st, 1974, they shut down Britannia Mine and Mill No. 3 fell silent. Gone too was the beacon that had shone each night over House Sound. For the community that had always been there to serve the mine, the darkness and silence must have been strangely disquieting. You know what? I'm going to leave you with the words of a longtime Britannia resident who put it much better than I ever could. Can I tell you the first time it really struck me that this place was gone? They decided in 74 to shut it down because it was costing too much to get the ore out and it wasn't profitable. One day I went to Squamish grocery shopping and when I came back the mill, the concentrator was dark. And I sat up on the bluff and I couldn't come home because I was crying so hard. It was the saddest thing. I'd never seen the mill building without lights in it. And that's when I knew it was over after being here for so many years. So the people had to move on. But the building itself remains, a testament to all who lived and worked here. And today, it's a National Historic Site. So I hope next time you're driving by, you might have a better understanding of what happened inside this amazing old building leaning against the mountainside. But not everything that happened, because some of that stays between us, right? Thanks for coming. just got to Shannon Falls Provincial Park. It's an amazing waterfall from the road. So we're hiking up to it now. We'll take you with us. Just stopped off at the town of Squamish. 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 And we're gonna go to what's the second best burger, it says, the Copper Coil in this Coil. region. <laughs> we'll see. We're on a burger. We're on a burger fit. Smoked brisket, bacon, pulled pork, black and chicken. Well, gang, that's going to do it for episode two of our Whistler adventure. Um, stay tuned to next week's video where we explore downtown Whistler with our friends and family, Don and Brenda. We have two more videos in this, in this series. Remember, we'd appreciate it if you consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment below. And wait to see what we're doing at the end of this video. Until next time, I hope to see you on the trails.
Okay, shoulder up. 